Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all those that are in attendance here at uh, Commander General Staff College and to all those that are watching us on the distance learning systems for this sixth presentation of academic year 2022 of the Commander General Staff School and the Commander General Staff College Foundation's co-sponsored interagency brown bag lecture series. Recognize a couple folks here. Our chairman for the board is here. Jerome Wampert, nice to see you. And then uh, Dean Kim, CGSC Dean, welcome gentlemen. Welcome to the other guests. Please come on in and take seats as you come in. Um, for those of you that I don't know or don't know me, I'm Rod Cox with the Commander General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of my partners, the Commander General Staff School, Colonel Tommy Cardoni, and Mr. Marv Nichols, it's our pleasure to present this lecture series to enhance the interagency awareness and education here at the college. This lecture is made possible by support from the Pro Foundation and locally from the First Command Financial Services. And I would recognize Colonel Matt Anderson is here. Thank you, First Command. We appreciate your support to be able to put on this type of lecture series. If you have any questions about financial planning, you can see uh, Colonel Anderson after this briefing. A couple of administrative notes. Our next interagency brown bag is scheduled for Wednesday, 20 April, where we'll have the Federal Bureau of Investigation here. It'll be located back up in our normal location up in the Arnold Conference Room, and at the same time, 1230, 1.30. And I will make a note that it will not be recorded based off the operational status of the agents that we'll be presenting. So it's kind of an interesting brief, and so I would urge you all to come to that because you won't be able to get it on the, the tape line. We'll have members here from the Heart of America Joint Terrorism Task Force, and they're going to be discussing the FBI's domestic terrorism program, and they're going to detail a case that happened here in the local area of Missouri back in 2020 as well. So something that interagency professionals should be aware of, and I urge you all to come join us, plan to join us for that event. Second thing I want to make you aware of is that uh, the foundation is offering an incentive for you to join the Alumni Association. For now through the uh, mid-April, we'll be uh, offering this special incentive to join the Alumni Association, because um, on Friday the 15th of April, we'll be hosting a VIP reception in coordination with our partners at the Kansas Speedway. They've allowed for us to do an activity there, so there'll be a VIP reception down in Victory Lane, an area not normally open to the public, as well as you'll have the opportunity, if you join as a life member, to drive your car around the racetrack or to ride in the NASCAR pace car. And then not, if that's not good enough, then if you are a NASCAR fan or even if you're not, we'll also be giving you a couple, pair of tickets to the 15 May NASCAR event Semi-annually, they have races here at the Kansas Speedway, and you'll be able to you'll give you free tickets to that event on 15 May for you to attend as well. So I urge you, if you're interested in that, to see one of us here um, after the briefing, stop by the office or go to our website and check out the special deal incentivizing joining the association. All right, to today's business. Today's presentation will be recorded for distance learning use and our satellite campuses, folks. Uh, on the blackboard and for IA practitioners that are stationed around the world. It's being streamed, as I mentioned, so that I ask for you here, if you engage in conversation with the presenter, that you touch on the microphones that are there. You just hit the little button there right in the middle, and you'll get a little red, red light around your microphone, and that'll indicate that you're live, and then you can talk, if you would, please. That way, your questions and your discussion can be picked up on the recording. There are many aspects to American foreign policy. Diplomatic and military efforts rarely come to mind for most of us when we think of the U.S. presence overseas. Often overlooked, however, is a very important aspect of our foreign policy, and that's the development partnership and assistance. With a mission statement that reads, on behalf of the American people, we promote and demonstrate democracy values abroad and advance a free, peaceful, and prosperous world. In support of America's foreign policy, the U.S. Agency for International Development leads the U.S. government's international development and disaster assistance through partnerships and investments that save lives, reduce poverty, strengthen democratic governance, and help people emerge from humanitarian crises and progress beyond assistance." End quote. This might give us a better insight in it, realizing how important USAID is, USAID is in promoting America, our democratic values, in functioning societies and peace and prosperity around the world. Today's discussion is designed to allow us to do just that. We're going to learn about what and how USAID does to further American foreign policy and to foster human dignity around the world. 
It's our pleasure today to have as our speaker, Dr. Mark Sorensen, who is an economic and business development specialist with over 40 years of experience to include 20 years with USAID. At USAID, he has served in a variety of supervisory roles and has had assignments which included duty at Pakistan, Brazil, South Sudan, Iraq, Georgia, Mongolia, Sri Lanka, and as well as in Washington, DC. I'll note that while in Iraq from 2009 to 2011, he served on a provincial reconstruction team, many of us are familiar with PRTs, and he directed USAID's programs in the, in the Divala province. His most recent assignment was as a supervisory education officer in Pakistan, managing USAID's $350 million education portfolio for that country. His language proficiency includes fluency in both Spanish and Portuguese, I'm assuming English as well. Dr. Sorensen holds a doctorate in education from the University of Houston, an MBA from Texas A&M, an MA from University of Florida, a Master's in Strategic Studies from the Air War College, and a BS and a BA from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. I did comment to him that I think he has the most impressive, impressive resume on our faculty. He's the author of several publications and the recipient of several meritorious honor and exemplary awards for government service. Please welcome Dr. Mark Sorensen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Boy, I feel good about myself after an intro like that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Thank you very much, the president of the foundation, CGSC Foundation. And thanks, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, Dean Kim, for attending today. Thank you, staff, faculty, and students for having interest in something I'm passionate about international development, foreign aid in general, USAID's role in leading that, well, international development for the USG, uh, US government, and uh, also some linkages between what we do in Department of Defense and linkages between what we do in international development and um, national security interests here at home as well. So that's what we're going to talk about today. My career that Mr. Cox just uh, briefed um, with USAID kind of reflects the fact that USAID ultimately develops its programs in response to negotiation between our government and host governments in the 100 plus countries that we work in. Um, Sri Lanka, I worked in economic growth during their civil war um, in the provincial, provincial reconstruction teams in Iraq uh, worked with the military in infrastructure and, and reconstruction efforts in Diala. Um, Brazil, our national interest pretty much focused with Brazil on biodiversity in the Amazon. So that's what I worked on. In Pakistan, it was leading the education portfolio um, with the interest in seeing the coming generation having educational opportunities to be part of their society, um, productively and have economic opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that as far as my background. I wanted to mention that there's a couple of USAID students that are probably on the online system right now, and that's Steve Reinecke in the SAMS program and Troy Tillis in the ASLSP program. Also wanted to mention Pat Wester. Pat, could you just wave to the crowd? is my predecessor to my predecessor as faculty for USAID here at Fort Leavenworth. Okay. <laughs> this is where we come from. Some of the evolution of international development assistance abroad for the US government I would just highlight the Marshall Plan was a predecessor of you know, work in international development that was very successful and I think contributed a lot of strategies to the US government about what we should be doing abroad. That then led to other policies. We were established by presidential decree by John F. in 1961, 61 years ago. And again, 
Mr. Cox referred to our mission statement. It's, it's good to just take a moment on that. We demonstrate democratic values abroad. Um, we have always a two-fold mission, help U.S. foreign policy interests and help those development interests of the countries that we are in, those 100 plus countries that we work in. If I were to ask people, is USAID part of Department of State? If I was to ask that in USAID and, you, and in the Department of State headquarters and elsewhere, I'd get a lot of different answers. I actually have an answer of kind of yes and no, we are part of Department of State. My colleague from Department of State, Terry Mobley, um, right there, uh, can also give his view. Um, in general, USAID is seen as an independent agency with our own autonomous congressional funding that is extremely aligned and driven um, by our cooperation with Department of State. So yes and no, we're within Department of State. Our administrator right here is Samantha Power. She is on the National Security Council and she's a past ambassador to the UN. This says something about, I mean, a big picture look uh, geographically about where we work. Um, two thirds of the countries that we work in are fragile states or have recently left conflict. The other way to look at where we work, Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, Latin America, is seeing where we spend our budget money. Um, it's hard to make out everything here, but on this line here, the legend explains that the lighter colored countries receive the more funding. And um, we're big in Africa, of course. Development challenges being very big in Africa uh, now and for decades to come. Countries graduate from USAID work, uh, Costa Rica, Turkey being a couple countries that graduated from our assistance not too long in the past. And you see a couple countries here that are kind of surprising. Um, what would we be doing in Venezuela, for example? Or you see some uh, coloration in Cuba. Uh, in those countries, we're not working directly with the government. We'd be working with civil society, uh, the business sector, professional associations, media. Um, basically the parts of society that we can work with, not in direct support of the government, and um, we can work for better services that those types of, those aspects of society can, can give the, to the citizens of those countries compared to the government. And, and I, I forgot to mention, I'll be so happy to get to the last 20 minutes or so of this speech when we can have more discussion but I, I think we can keep most of our questions and comments until the end, and I'll try to move right along. When U.S. citizens are surveyed, the findings show that anywhere from 20, that the American, average American citizen thinks that our federal budget spends about 20 to 28 percent of its budget in foreign assistance. That's the common perception of how much money goes abroad in real assistance. The reality is right here. 1%, just about 1%. Two, U, USAID spends about two thirds of that 1%. So here's our budget figure that we're operating on this year, 27 some billion and um, Again, that amount is two-thirds of 1% of our whole USAID budget. Um, the, okay, and, and these are some of the major areas of work, the themes of work that we work in. Health and humanitarian assistance, very big. Um, development, democracy, human rights, um, significant. Um, education, agriculture, 
environment now with climate change and peace and security. A lot of different areas. Whenever I talk about billions of dollars going to foreign aid, even if it's less than, just slightly less than 1%, when I'm talking to taxpayers, I like to bring up some of these topics of what U.S. gets, not just in its impact on stability and national security, which we'll get to a little bit more, but other things that U.S. gets concretely here in America. We develop trading partners. 11 of the 15 largest U.S. trading partners were once recipients of foreign aid. Think Taiwan, think South Korea. Um, think what they might be now. I mean, they did it on their own, but if USA as a country did not have some role in their earlier development, would they be as big a trading partner with us now or not? Probably not. Um, I think very significant to every American citizen is Ebola is not in America. USAID led the fight against Ebola. Of course, CDC, Centers for Disease, um, CDC, Communication control. and Control, thank you, Dean. Uh, CDC and USAID, but USAID was the lead. Um, it's, it's not come to America. Um, just last week, we distributed our 500 millionth vaccine against COVID internationally. Um, also, a lot of incubators and other equipment, and the systems to use that equipment. And, uh, you know, bottom line here, in reality, as the world's most prosperous, large country in the world, of course, we have a responsibility to lend a hand to the hundred-some countries, I think, of course. We have some role, you can debate how much, but some role to help the other countries of the world develop in, in ways especially that make them friends in our, in our view of the world in the future. Key results of development, kind of broadly speaking, this is not USAID taking credit for all of these huge worldwide impacts, fighting poverty, fighting health and pandemic issues, um, fighting economic uh, issues, et cetera, but USAID was a big part of all of these fights, fighting poverty and um, health issues around the world that, that, you know, has had this kind of progress in the recent decades. USAID is the lead federal agency for these two areas. Um, Development assistance and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I want to take a moment on that. I want to skip ahead here for a second to kind of differentiate these types of our work. Um, maybe a lot going on here, but in general here, this is an interesting graphic that shows at the top how USAID defines foreign assistance, you could say. And down here is a little bit more how DOD describes and has a vocabulary for foreign assistance in humanitarian assistance. We, in USAID, use the term humanitarian assistance for kind of the more dire assistance, getting food to people, tents, um, keeping them healthy after a tsunami, earthquake, et cetera, um, feeding some people after a famine and drought. Um, that's our term for humanitarian assistance when you have to really step in and create systems sometimes just to take care of the people and keep them from dying. Um, and then DOD has the term HA, more broadly speaking, to all these many, many different types of assistance that DOD does give abroad, um, OHDA, CA um, initiatives. And then um, when things like I was in South Sudan, it was the year after their independence, incredibly poor country, but they were somewhat getting on their feet. We were working on education efforts, and then tribal warfare breaks out in a bigger way, and it was just the main challenge of keeping people from killing each other and keeping people fed and alive. So we had to move our strategy from over there, where we like to work in having a longer-term impact, 
on a country to just taking care of the immediate crises. So that, that's kind of what's going on there. And so when I, as I back up here, I said that USAID is the lead uh, officially for those two kind of very different types of foreign aid, okay? I'll, I'll move down to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief for a moment. A lot of DOD people are, you know, kind of maybe with a perspective of that's a lot of what USA does because that's where a lot of DOD people interact with us after earthquake, tsunami, uh, flood, or whatever. Um, I know some people in the audience have worked with us in those efforts. Um, those fast onset natural disasters that we see in the news and, and DOD works so well with, with us on getting us the security um, established, the transportation, the heavy equipment to fight, the, the, in, fight in the responses to those natural disasters is there at the top. Slow onset disasters, drought, and man-made conflict is actually 80% of the disasters that we respond to. So most of our disaster response is in the area of man-made conflict, civil wars, terrorism, uh, extremism, whatever. Um, and on average, that whole field of work uh, responds to about 70 disasters in 50 countries around the world annually. A lot of people here are familiar with OFDA, Office for Foreign Disaster Assistance. OFDA is now within the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. We've been reorganized a bit, but um, that's OFDA's area of work. Now I'm, I'm going to move a little bit more to development's impact on national security and a little bit more on why it's important for DOD officials um, to, you know, some of the things that are important for us to know about each other. Um, this is just a very informal graphic out of my mind about here, the causes of instability around the world. Again, two-thirds of the countries that we work in are labeled fragile states, fragile states, um, or recently left conflict, fragile state being in actual danger of losing control of its territorial boundaries without the use of force and not providing, in most cases, much basic services to its citizenry. Um, so, you know, causes of fragile states and other forms of instability around the world um, we have a lot of all of this going on in a lot of countries of the world right now. We've got, I think, depending on how you count conflicts, we've got about 27 conflicts of some kind or another in the world right now. Um, I just li list those things as why those things are happening around the world. Um, and then over here, the factors of stability. These are vulnerabilities in a country. These are factors of stability. USAID works in all of those uh, depending on the needs of the country. Reducing, hopefully in the long term, the f causes of instability. I I'm going to actually take a pause for a moment. Any, anybody have any question up to this point? I'd be happy for any question. Okay, thanks. And again, getting into a little bit more of the link between defense and development. Uh, straight from the national security strategy, it points to, you know, the importance of development to security, the importance of security to development, and the twofold goals of international work is, all, international development for USAID, again, is improving the conditions on the ground for the people of the particular country based on their needs that are negotiated between our government and their government, and also our foreign policy objectives. I like former Secretary Robert Gates's quote, you can't have development without security, you can't have security without development. Uh, we can't be in some of the countries that we um, go to without DOD providing us security. Um, in the long run, a lot of the battles that are being fought against extremism, uh, 
terrorism, et cetera, can't be fought militarily alone. Um, so you can't have security without development. You can't have development without security. I think it says a lot. Development in, in, in the middle, I, I just quote that. Development investments can counteract the political, social, economic vulnerabilities that contribute to straight state fragility. That's you know, another way of saying the last slide. Um, that's a lot of our work is counteracting those vulnerabilities that are in a lot of our 100 plus countries. We increase global security by addressing the root causes of violence that I pointed to, um, lack of good governance, corruption, um, lack of health systems, growing threats from climate change, et cetera. We, we attack those root causes, poverty, um, and it's a long-term area of work, of course, that USAID is constantly in, in, into. Here I tried to capture a few of the ways that DOD staff, especially when you're positioned, stationed abroad, can concretely tie into USAID resources, knowledge, um, relationships. Um, a lot of our personnel have been in the particular countries for some years. Our postings are, are in general four years. And then our local staff quite often have 10, 20, 30 years of experience in USAID in their country. So we've got the relationships that you know, we want to share when people in, in civil affairs units and other um, postings um, need to find out about our assessments, about our relationships with the private sector, the government sector, uh, civil society. We have our own early warning um, conflict, early warning systems. Um, and we have some courses that we share with DOD, just like um, we have people like myself and our students that are posted here. We have courses, shorter courses for, that are sometimes open to DOD officials. Uh, I think the Joint Humanitarian Operations course is taught here every year, maybe in the fall, I believe. The MC2 is a position, and, and we also have our people, our staff, a high, higher level people in all the six COCOMs and Pentagon. And uh, then in each of our countries, 100 plus, we have a person who is called the MC2. This is just the graphic of kind of a typical USAID mission. Our USAID missions are called, our offices are called missions. Um, so generally inside the embassy, sometimes separate, but increasingly inside the embassy, along with state and treasury and whoever else are the US federal agencies there. Um, so MC squared person is a civil military coordinator who is officially appointed at every mission in the world um, to be the liaison to DOD. So that person has these responsibilities. It's, it's a liaison position um, to go to um, I think anybody stationed abroad should, in, in DOD should definitely know the MC squared person. Big picture, I love the three Ds of foreign policy. It's a model for what are the president's tools in foreign policy. The president can use diplomacy, he can use defense, he can use development. That kind of covers it, the president's tools. So Department of State, DOD, USAID. I'll, I'll just read that because I like it. <laughs> Stable, prosperous, and friendly states enhance American security and boost US economic opportunities. Taking another look at the country's tools of foreign policy, almost everybody here is well familiar with DIME, DIME. And then a lot of people add FIL to be more inclusive of all the different tools that we have in foreign policy. Okay? And no one has development in there, but I, I think development is such an important tool in our foreign policy that I like to add D to make it dime-filled, um, you know, finance right now, very important, shutting off uh, 
access to the oligarchs of Russia. Um, you know, you know every, everything's, everything's important, but I think development has as big or bigger role to play in our foreign policy in lesser developed countries than, for example, the F in finance. A bit about USAID's people, our staff. Quickly, we have about 1,850 Foreign Service officers like myself and Terry in Department of State. I mean, in USAID, we have 1,824. We're limited to 1,850. Um, in comparison, Department of Defense has 6,500 musicians in ensembles. <laughs> so um, that tells you a little bit about the scale between, of course, we all know the scale difference between USAID and DOD. Uh, and those musicians are doing important PR and recruitment work, but um, that's what we are limited to, too. Um, then a lot of our work is done by Foreign Service Nationals, just like Terry said last month, being the very important cultural understanding and, and you know, the people that know the country and are able to get to where we're not able to get to in insecure environments. Um, are a big part of our population. Most of our staff overall is abroad, not in D.C. Um, we are an educated staff. We're the second most educated staff in the federal bureaucracy. And these are some of our areas of competency. It's the big areas of work. Again, how we deploy all those activities are dependent on the country's needs and dialogue with the local national government, for the most part, negotiation. And in the middle are some of the ways that we do that work. I want to emphasize we are not a giveaway effort. We don't give that much away. The field of international development has learned over the decades that's not a, a, a great strategy. Um, we are a, a, an agency that plans. We are an agency that monitors and evaluations, evaluates our programs, and our efforts are driven by strategies tied to results frameworks. USAID culture, those people uh, in our staff, I would say, you know, I think we all probably have a little bit of an intuitive, intuitive feel or from your experience working with USAID. Uh, we are not a hierarchical organization. Uh, we're, we're built on consensus, we're built on ground up, we're built on planning for the local country's needs. Um, we you know, drive plans with locally sourced expertise, and our perspective in general is the long term. We're not there to come into Tanzania and solve the problems in a five-year plan. We know that we'll be there for a lot more years than that. We partner, it's, it's, I don't think, I wouldn't even call it a whole of government approach. It's a whole of world approach when you're working in development. You've got to work with everybody. In every country that we work in, there's donor coordination committees where we're working with the Japanese, the Germans, the Brits, et cetera. Um, we're working deeply. I, I think a lot of people don't know how deeply we work with the private sector, how deeply we try to deploy technology in our work. It's not, you know, grass huts development where you're, you're teaching people a, a bit better plow, um, like 50 years ago type of international development. We're, we're introducing e-commerce systems to Slovakia, et cetera. Um, this is a very generic slide. Of course, we, we, we have it as deeply in our policy to plan, implement, um, and learn along with DOD. And on the left here are some of the different areas that we work with DOD. Um, if we're putting in an electrical system in Iraq, um, then DOD energy people are, are with us uh, on down the line. This is some of our staff based at the different COCOMs. Um, at each COCOM, there'd be a senior development advisor and a deputy development advisor. This is 
just slightly prior to a, a recent reorganization of a, a few offices, but this is how we're, we're structured geographically, Bureau of Asia, Bureau of Africa, et cetera, and thematically, uh, Office of Civil Rights and Diversity, um, et cetera. This is a, a complicated graphic about how we plan together. USAID is here in the middle, state over here. We definitely, as I mentioned, are really a, a country needs driven agency. So one of our first types of plans is the country development cooperation strategy. It lays out our analyses of environment, gender, sustainability, et cetera, political factors, and what we want to do in that country. Um, so I think that's usually a you know, four or five year plan that builds into the integrated, well, we give that our plan into the integrated country strategy, which some of you that have sat at country team meetings in the embassies would, might have heard USAID giving our plan into the integrated country strategy, just like your DOD um, communicated within the integrated country strategy to a degree, I, I, I guess. And then it goes up um, to more regional uh, strategies and ultimately coordinated with DOD as, as best we can. <laughs> and that's, again, kind of our root, you could say our root big plan for the, what we will do in a particular country. It's supported by analyses of all these different factors. And it's done in coordination with the local government. Okay, um, I think we're, we're getting cl real close to our question and dialogue time, which is great. This is actually the, the key takeaway wrap-up slide. Um, the lead their instability abroad leads to insecurity at home. Um, I, I think USAID recognizes its role in contributing to national security um, very deeply. Um, being on the National Security Council now, um, we deploy the resources to make sure that our programs have as much a contribution to national security as possible. Um, we are the smallest of the three Ds, diplomacy, defense, development, but you can tell I think development has a big contribution to play um, at less than, well, in our case, two-thirds of 1% more could come from international development if there was more money put into it. Um, but already a lot comes out um, of our contributions. Um, in the whole area of development assistance, again, long-term, hopefully sustainable impact on these countries and humanitarian assistance, more the short-term assistance, um, mainly natural and man-made conflict, man -made conflict and, and other natural disasters in the short term when we go in and respond and the longer term goal of uh, developmental assistance being sustainable for the long term, we're the lead agency for that. Um, we do plan extensively. We're, we're continually um, planning and, and our plans um, take place after a lot and a lot of months quite often of analyses and planning. Um, our decision making, as you can imagine, isn't sometimes as, as rapid as DOD can be when you're more hierarchically driven in your decision making, but we, we, are, plan we are a planning and action-based organization like you all. Um, one, one colleague said the other day, USAID and DOD kind of understands each other quite often because ultimately we are both agencies that have the goal of impacting change. We're, we're not analyses driven or report driven. We do those things. But our goal in any particular country that we work in is to impact change, to move the needle um, in the condition uh, in that country for their people and bring benefits back home. So in that way, we're just so similar. And I'll wrap up and get to questions by saying, you know, we coordinate with DOD brothers and sisters um, at strategic, operational, and tactical levels. Um, so depending on where you are, um, 
I think it, it is very important to know about what USAID does, how we do international development, and, uh, and tie into our resources and, and understand what we're doing and reduce redundancies between what we all do. And that is how to get a hold of me after our discussion with further questions or comments or corrections or whatever you like. I'm up on fourth floor of this building and uh, I, I definitely welcome as much more communication from the audience both online and in person here today as possible. So, um, Dr. Mr. Cox will open it up for questions. Good. Happy to have questions, great. Dean. Yeah, what's the relationship between the Millennium Challenge and USAID? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, Millennium Challenge Corporation being set up under the George W. Bush administration with the drive to rewarding good behavior, you could say, simplifying it, on the part of countries that we aid. Um, and so countries present their progress if they've got a lot of corruption going. They've show, they're showing what they've done to reduce corruption. And if they're you know, needing a major improvement in their health system, they're pointing to how they're starting to put more resources into their health system. And they, they show competency and success. And then their um, allotment of US assistance is determined by progress. So that's the general strategy. Um, the, it's a little bit of a, a different model. I think it's a complementary. It's great that some countries um, can get funding and support in that way. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to put one push on the spot, if you don't mind, Dean Kim. Pat, do you have anything further to say on MCC and their status these days? And, and if, I, if there's any complementarity or not complementary between USAID and Yeah, MCC? I would just, just add that I think it's about a billion dollars per year. They usually focus on large infrastructure programs. And as Mark was saying, it's based upon a scorecard. MCC is working with the good performers on democracy, economic growth, human rights, uh, while USAID works with the good performers and perhaps the bottom feeders. Uh, I hope that's not recorded. Over. <laughs> The more challenging situations, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Is that good? OK. Other questions? I know we've got other questions. Let's, let's enjoy this. Yes, please. Dr. Sorensen, I noticed in the USAID uh, org chart, you have a director at our Bureau of Policy, Planning, and Learning. Could you speak to me a little bit about uh, what constitutes learning within USAID and, and how that's used uh, when you're working with individual countries, how transmissible are, is learning from one experience, one country to another? Thank yeah, you. yeah, good question. The Bureau there of Policy Planning and Learning, we have major learning initiatives. Um, we've learned, you know, we wanna be and we are a knowledge organization um, that is having to continually study what we do and what works and what doesn't. Um, there's continual efforts to weed out um, things in our systems that slow activities, procurements down, for example. So we're constantly looking at, okay, how can we learn from this and this and this example um, to make our procurement, that's like, for example, procuring services on a, big basis on a large scale basis in a country to do a, a program. It's a continual process to study how we're doing and learn. Um, that it, I, would, I would just say we try to make that learning step um, fundamental in all of our processes. Um, I, I might have to give it some thought and, and do some research to get you a better 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 answer, and good thing that you're just down the hall, but uh, um, how, we, how we integrate learning, we try to integrate it in everything we do, and there's probably some ways that I think I'll benefit by looking at how DOD does that and compare it to USAID. So I'll, I'll want to get back to you some more on, on that. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Yeah, thank you.
Other questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I noticed that you briefed a couple times that you have a five-year planning for your country development strategies. Uh, but then you also mentioned that you have about a four-year rotation of your personnel on station. Does that inherent what seems to me be a conflict of people and execution of strategy impact on your success? Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, there is that constant flow of people coming in and out, and um, it's very rare for a USAID person to come in to a country and be able to affect the needs assessment, put in their ideas, and be part of the selection of what is the actual intervention we are going to do, and then be part of that procurement of our team, our quite often, um, you know, local and international groups that come in and are able to do the field work, and then be able to take the next step, which we do recognize has to happen whenever possible, which is the monitoring and evaluation and the learning thereof. Um, you know, a project can, can, a project can be designed for five years. A project can go on for seven years. Um, so yeah, very rarely does one person have the nice privilege of being there at the very start and then getting all the way to the end. So I think, frankly, I think USAID people are just very accustomed to coming in, okay, the needs assessment has been done, now we're procuring. Okay, that's been done, now we are doing, you know, the field-based monitoring and, you know, annual uh, tweaks to our strategy. Or now we are deeply, and, and there's people that are also on a one and two year assignment, um, especially the insecure environments like Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan are on quite often one year assignments. Um, and they can come in and they're only seeing one piece of that kind of like five step process. So good question. Um, you know, we have continuity because I think we have people that are accustomed to doing the handoffs from needs assessment to reporting on evaluation. Thank you. Questions? And, and, and we will let you go out on time, whether or not there's questions. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot yeah. here real quick. Um, can you give a specific example of USAID and DOD collaborating in either Pakistan, South Sudan, or Iraq where you served? Yeah, well, in the pre pre provincial reconstruction teams, of course, were there, um, USAID was the lead development advisor in each of the somewhere around 15, 16 provincial reconstruction teams, um, you know, working on the gamut with DOD energy, you know, electrification, uh, refugee um, services, um, agriculture. Um, in outside of Diala, there was a major uh, need for just getting people some source of livelihood. So, um, you know, we worked with DOD designing the well drigging well drilling um, effort in that very arid area um, and you know of course it was security details with, secu uh, with DOD getting us out there but in, in working with all sorts of different DOD folks um, sometimes with USAID funding sometimes DOD funding USAID would concur or not concur with any of their inf interventions on humanitarian assistance um, and um, in, in Pakistan, it's not um, a good example because my education portfolio did not really have to be coordinated with DOD. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, one or two other it, questions. We, I, yeah. I think it was just yeah. maybe a little bit of an expansion on that. Is uh, so if a U.S. military unit's going to engage with USAID in, in theater, you know, how do they? Um, how do they uh, find unity effort? How do they cooperate? What what what's that dynamic that makes it successful instead of? Yeah, out successful? in the field in a country in conflict. I think you you may be asking, or or well, even even out even uh, in a not non in a permissive environment now. Yeah, right. Yeah. For one thing, I think it's good to remember that position, which is which is called civil military coordinator position. Um, that person's not the highest level in the mission in our terminology mission, USAID mission, but they are charged with being the DOD 
liaison. So they have to be able to say, okay, this is your interest. You need to talk to our economic growth team leader about what we're doing in that province. Um, you need to um, read. Um, you're wanting to have an impact on the um, extremist youth population in, in the country. And you need to, you know, here, here's this resource of our analyses of uh, factors driving youth into violent extremism in Tunisia or whatever. So um, that MC squared person is important. Um, the mission director um, is so busy and at, is at such a high level, um, you know, most people from any agency will be directed to another person other than the mission director um, to, to get started coordinating with USAID. Yes, Terry. I was just going to say, in addition to that, at most embassies and consulates, you have working groups that are established that include representatives from the various agencies represented. So they might have a working group that deals specifically with development issues, for example, that brings uh, those various entities together, law enforcement, counterterrorism, you name it, just about any topic you can think of. There's very often a, a working group within the embassy that includes aid and DOD and so forth. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Terry. Dean? Yeah, when I was in Afghanistan, we dealt with Title 10, Title 22, and Title 50 funds. We had some clear lines of how those funds could be spent. Are all of USAID's fundings through Title 22 and therefore subject to the approval by the mission, by the uh, ambassador? Yeah, everything would go through Chief of Mission, the ambassador. And is it all Title 22, or do you know? I don't know that, um, if they would all be. I have to get back to you guys on that. Yeah. Make a quick scribble here to remember. So good, thanks. Yes, sir. I think the head. There we go. Now I found it. All right, uh, Eric Rouse, uh, uh, former um, AFRICOM liaison to USAID, uh, got to, to work with USAID during uh, um, Ebola, um, during Libya, and many other occasions there. And one of the great things uh, that was brought up here is about uh, the coordination aspect. And when it's a large project like Ebola, the coordination was something that was naturally happening because we were doing it in D.C. and it, everybody was focused on the same aspect. But during that time period, what the military was called to do were things that we had the ability, a very unique ability to do, which was uh, quick, rapid planning on how to execute different types of events, uh, how to build um, medical facilities, how to uh, train large numbers of doctors and, and things. Um, where more of the issues came up were when we had a small civil affairs team who decided, hey, this is a great idea for something we need to do here. And they did not have, because they were jumping in and out of country so quickly, did not have those communications with the embassy. And that's really where that MC squared uh, comes into play, is having those connections as they get in there to be able to to feed off of the knowledge that USAID has in country so that as we're doing our activities, we can ensure that they're actually affecting the things that we're wanting to affect. So it was, a, it was something that's a great opportunity. There are uh, five military physicians or six uh, up there at the headquarters in, uh, in DC, one for each one of the uh, um, uh, combatant commands. So it's a great opportunity to learn there along with ensuring that we get information out to, uh, to the force as we continue to go ahead and, and work together, which with, with more and more peace comes more and more activities that we do as a military out in areas to gain access, and through that, uh, working with USAID to understand how that works. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I love your personal experiences. And that makes me think back to Pat's question about concrete experiences of DOD, USAID collaboration. I think back to a uh, big market renovation project that was decided, frankly, by DOD, let's do this. And then as lead for that provincial reconstruction team development advisor, there were issues. Um, you know, when they were doing that, they were also helping some businesses at the expense of a lot of other businesses that could develop. So that was a case where the coordination didn't happen fast enough and early enough to have as much positive collaboration on that particular project as we could have had. So that's one thing about out in the field, DOD, USAID, 
collaboration that I think is a, a success model is coordinating early um, so that both agencies can be informed of each other's activities in order to you know, give value added um, before too many plans are done. And then um, at that point, I remember in that particular project, some things were so well decided it was going to happen, and I couldn't kind of steer it into some other ways. But anyway, um, one, one last question or two, please. Yep. Yes. Dr. Sorson, uh, are you aware of what USAID's activities may or may not be in Eastern Europe right now? Yeah, good question. Um, in Ukraine specifically, um, massive assistance to you know, the corridors for people departing, massive assistance to the countries in the area, Poland, et cetera, where we do have missions, Moldova, and are helping the people um, with basic needs once they, they have to leave Ukraine. Um, Ukraine's been a, a recipient of a lot of USAID assistance over, I can't remember how many years, but a good number of years. Um, so I, I would just summarize as a lot of kind of humanitarian assistance at that point and with Samantha Power at the National Security Council advocating you know, for the, keeping up the pressure to try to keep some of that population of people leave, having to leave safe and, and healthy as possible. That's, that's one big thing that's happening in Ukraine. And, and then our, our general portfolio, um, you know, just like in Afghanistan, um, you know, it's, it's getting to be a humanitarian crisis there with a lot of people seriously in danger of starvation. Um, when we're not there with people because we can't be there, sometimes we have our, our contractors there being able to affect um, some services and, and keep some people out of, out, you know, the, the most critical of, of needs, like just having enough food to eat. So. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your presentation here. Thank you, Dr. Swartzen. Um, just want to remind you that our next brown bag presentation will be on 20 April. Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Heart of America Joint Task Force Terrorism. It will not be recorded, so we ask that you come in person if you want to see that. And then I'll remind you to once again talk to one of us if you're, if you're a NASCAR's person and you're interested in taking advantage of the incentives we've got for the Alumni Association, see one of us or pick up one of the flyers. Thank you all much for attending. We'll see you next time.